Hi everyone, this is Sébastien Bardin and Manugan Guyen from Cerealist and Université Grenoble Alpes, France. We are going to talk to you today about directed fuzzing and use after free bugs. This is joint work with our colleagues Richard Bonichon, Mathieu Lemaire and Roland Gross. So, what's the talk about? Fuzzing has been proven to be great for finding vulnerabilities in the wild. Today, we will focus on directed fuzzing, a slightly different setting where the goal is to reach a specific code target, with application, for example, to patch-oriented testing. Uh, the problem we want to address is that current fuzzing techniques are very bad for some class of complex vulnerabilities. Here, use after free. Unfortunately, they are sensitive and can be critical. So we propose a directed fuzzing approach tailored to use after free bugs, and we'll show some application to patch-oriented testing. So first of all, what is a use after free? Uh, it's an error that occurs when some uh, memory has been allocated, then freed, then it is still accessed uh, after its lifetime uh, through a dangling pointer. Uh, so there are some three points here. First, it is critical. It can lead to data corruption, information leak, denial of service attack, and so on. Uh, second, there are more and more of them in the wild. Uh, maybe a reason is that currently buffer overflow and so on are well protected and well mitigated, and many tools exist to, to try to remove them in advance, while use after free are still hard to mitigate and hard to find. Uh, last point, it's quite a complex uh, vulnerability, actually. If you think of a standard buffer overflow, uh, you just need at some point to, to, to go uh, out of bounds. Where in that case you have some kind of finite state automaton, like we see in the in the right corner, uh, that you must fulfill before activating the, the issue. So as a teaser, here is a small example. You don't really need to know what this code time does exactly. The point is there is a use after free in it. If you go through the allocation, then the free and then the use. Um, now, if you take IFL on this small code, actually IFL QMU, to go on binary, within six hours, it cannot find it. If you take IFL Go, a directed further, which will work on source, and with an adequate um, trust target, again, within six hours, it will not find the use after free bug. With our technique, called UFS, within 20 minutes, we are indeed able to find this use after free bug. So first of all, a bit of context. So as most of you probably know, fuzzing is very popular for finding code level flaws. It has found many, many, many bugs. It is used by many security people and security teams, and many big companies are involved, Microsoft, Google, Apple, whatever you want, mostly. Uh, actually, uh, fuzzing's come from quite a quite long time now. Uh, first, it means uh, mostly random testing, uh, which is called now black box fuzzing, and it consists in generating massive amount uh, of input data, feed them to the program under test, and see if it's crash or not. Okay, it was very simple, but it turns out to be very effective. But along the years, it had made uh, huge progress, so now there are three shades of fuzzing, so there is still this black box approach to fuzzing. There is also something called white box fuzzing, which uses uh, lots of advanced program analysis techniques to find bugs, but which has problems with scalability. And there is gray box fuzzing, which try to take uh, the best of both sides, scalability from black box approach and cleverness from white box approach. And actually, IFL was probably the first gray box fuzzer, it was a very pioneering and inspiring work, and it has been very, very successful. And now this is a very active research area with more and more new ideas to, to move the sweet spot and add more and more intelligence in the tool without any scalability penalty. So from, uh, I'll give you just a little test of what fuzzing is. So basically, you have a set of input. You need a way, some heuristic, to choose a good input to select which are the best one. So for example, those input which, uh, which activate new part of the code, for example. Then you will uh, create lots of new input from them, from mutation, so input which 
looks pretty similar to the initial good input, but a bit different. And then you will simply run them all against the code under test. Look, uh, compute, look, observe their behavior, compute their score, take the best again, and then mutate them, and so on and so on, in some kind of evolutionary process. So here the big difference between black box fuzzing and gray box fuzzing is that uh, in black box you cannot observe a lot, uh, especially uh, mostly only the output. In gray box you can observe typically coverage information, stuff like that. Obviously, uh, fuzzing is not a silver bullet, so it can have a hard time uh, covering very complex uh, condition or going very deep inside the code. Okay, It has a hard time with complex bugs like use after free, we will discuss that after. And it has also, it may also have a hard time to, to do some target oriented testing, where the goal is to cover some specific part of the code. So, regarding this last point, recently a new flavor of fuzzing has emerged directed fuzzing that precisely aims at tackling this problem. So you take an additional input, which is a target, either a trace, a code trace, or a code location, and what you want is to find an input which will cover this trace. So either cover the trace or reach the location. So it has interesting application in security, such as bug reproduction. So typically you have some partial uh, information report on a bug, but you don't have the input, the triggering input. So with directed fuzzing, you can try to find the triggering input for this bug report. Patch-oriented testing, where you will try to direct your testing towards some specific part of the code, typically a patch. And for example, confirmation of static analysis report to see if there are false positive, false alarm, or real problems. Uh, the very, very first directed gray box uh, Directed gray box further was Eiffel Go in 2017. So this line of research is kind of new. So from a more technical point of view, actually coverage guided gray box fuzzing, so standard gray box fuzzing, and directed gray box fuzzing are not that different. So this is a high level view of coverage guiding gray box fuzzing. So first you have some instrumentation step where you will add to the code all the information you need to record typically coverage information. Then you have the fuzzing loop by itself with seed selection, mutation, uh, also you can give uh, some power schedule to which is time budget to seeds according to their score with a good seed having better score and so on. Then you need also a way, which is called here triage, to distinguish between bugs and uh, non-bugs. So for buffer overflow, it's pretty simple, actually. Uh, when it crashes, then you have a bug. You can miss a few buffer overflow, but most of the time it will be OK. Uh, for something like use after free, it will be much more complicated, as we'll see. So now, if we look at directed gray box fuzzing, it's mostly the same. So you have an additional uh, input, which is the target, and one additional component, which is the seed distance, meaning the distance between an input, the execution of an input, and the, tr the target you want to reach. Uh, once you have that, then basically it follows the same architecture, except that typically some part of the, of the architecture will take the distance into information, into account, for example, uh, the power schedule. So now, coming back to use after free, uh, as we saw before, there are more and more of them. Yet, actually, further do not find a lot of them. We have statistics uh, from OSS Fuzz on the, on the right part. Uh, actually, there are deep reasons for that. There are two main difficulties for ending use after free bugs with Fuzzer. The first one is that there are very strong temporal and spatial constraints for this kind of bugs. They are very, very complicated because you have this temporal constraint. You, you need a, to find an event, a sequence of events, so the allocation, the deallocation, and the use in this specific order. And also some spatial constraint because all these events must, uh, must relate to the same memory cell. And here, really, fuzzing has a really, really hard time compared to buffer overflow, where typically you just need to reach one point in the code with big enough arguments. The second point, which is hard for fuzzing, 
is that uh, usually for you user after free you don't have uh, you, you don't have uh, any crash so it's kind of a silent bug so what people will do if they want to find use after free with fuzzing is to equip fuzzer with a uh, with a sanitizer like valgrind and so to run it uh, to run sanitized execution but there is a big uh, uh, runtime overhead with that, and this is a problem actually, because fuzzing is good because it is able to to create a very huge amount of input. So if you have runtime overhead, you will uh, run much much less input, and you will be less effective. So this is a big problem too. So, and actually it happens that both fuzzing and directed fuzzing have a very hard time in practice on use after free. So recall our tiny motivating example. So now that I have set up the stage, Mandung will explain our technique for use after free directed fuzzing. Uh, thanks Sebastian. I will present UAFAS a little further for use after free box and then draw some conclusion. Before discussing our techniques, so we first revise the workflow of Richard Father and show the limitations in finding use after free. Existing Richard Father are distant guided, so however, the, the instrumentation phase at short level is costly, it's around several hours for complex programs, and it cannot differentiate the differences between two inputs covering uh, the same set of basic blocks but in different order. This thing way buffering just at least equally. However, given the set of predefined target, the likelihood of S destination being reachable to targets are different. Consequently, in some cases, they might waste effort exploring non vulnerable code or invisible path leading to specified target. Also, previous work uh, don't take into account the orderings of cover basic block when selecting inputs for mutation. They might skip input that uh, already cover in sequence several target basic block. Next, uh, as UAF bugs fail silently, we need to choose our own input produced by the father to find the proof concept input. Such a large amount of unreachable input with a lot of time in the sanitizer by just the process. To address the limitation discussed above, so we propose UA Fast, a written father dedicated to use after free bugs by carefully tuning the key component of written fuzzing to meet specific characteristics of this type of bug. <coughs> Overall, UAFast has a similar workflow as Richter Father, and we add our improvement highlighted in orange along the whole fuzzing process. First, the static pre computation of UAFast is fast at binary level. Second, we introduce new input metrics to guide the father toward target at runtime. Finally, we choose the only potential inputs covering on targets in the expected choice and pre filter for free input that are less likely to trigger the bug. Overall, we select input for mutation based on similarities and orderings of input choice compared to the expected choice. We assess the likelihood of an input based on three metrics dedicated to UAF at different levels of granularities, function cones, edges, and basic block. So the more fine-grained the metric is, the more precise the analysis is in terms of identifying interesting input that are likely cover the expected trait. So in the next slide, we will detail our input metric. And we focus on bug reproduction and pass testing application. So it's more likely we have a complete uh, stack trace of own memory related UF event. So in this case, unlike uh, existing zero related approach, we need to take into account the relationship among targets to improve uh, relatedness. So to facilitate our further analysis, 
we must own stack trace as shown in the figure on the left hand side to recreate a dynamic calling tree then perform a pre-order traversal of this tree to uh, generate a bug trace at our target so we make sure that the children are ordered according to the orderings of the EOF event after the flattening process mm. Previous uh, seat distance do not account for any order among the target location, why is uh, essential for UAF. So we address the issue by actually modifying the distance between function in the cone graph to favor part that sequentially go through the three UAF events, allow free and use of the bug tray. This is done by decreasing the width of the edge in the cone graph that are likely to be between the events using lightweight static analysis. So our distance-based technique therefore consider both calling relation in general, for example in some cases where the colony can appear several times at different locations in the color, and the calling relation covering even have event in sequence. As existing work treat as is equally in terms of uh, reaching sequence target in sequence targets, we propose a lightweight cut edge coverage metric by measuring progress at at level, but on the critical disease note only. First, we statically identify cut edge whose destination are more likely to reach the next target in the box tray. As shown in the figure. It's lightweight because we only perform static intra-procedural analysis of control flow graph. At runtime, uh, UFRs favor inputs exercising more cut edge via score depending on the number of cover cut edge and the hit count. <coughs> the sequence acquired target similar metric concretely assess how many targets a seat execution tray cover at runtime and also take uh, orderings of the target in, into account. We combine both prefix and back option as prefix option uh, is more precise because it counts value until the first diversion in the bug tray and the back option also provides more information about the whole tray. Then we use uh, this metric for seed selection by actually selecting more frequently input that are most similar to the target bug tray. So overall, the UFAs prioritize or assign more energy to input in the following cases. First, input that are closer to the bug tray by our distance metric. Second, Inputs that are more similar to the expected tray by our target similarity metric. Finally, input that make better decision at critical code junction by our cut edge coverage metric. In the triage process, you will first uh, only potential input with cover in sequence on target location in the bug tray. So we obtain uh, this kind of information for free via our target similarity metric. For implementation, we build our two UFAs on top of uh, the popular father FL in QMU mode. We use IDA Pro to get the control flow graph of the tested binaries and we also uh, aim to support more open source uh, binary disk assembler like Radar and then we deploy blockchain block of the binary analysis framework being set for static computation uh, finally we use uh, the profiling tool like Van Grant in the triage process for evaluation we evaluate our approach in Two applications. 
So for book reproduction, we compare our tool with the state of the art graphic guided and with the father on 13 UAF books of real programs. As FGO is a uh, by father and Hawkeye is not available, so we implemented uh, their core techniques on our framework. Also, we use uh, time to exposure number of book file overhead and number of changing input as uh, comparison metric. And you can see in the figures, UAFAS outperform state of the art faster in terms of uh, book reproduction with a high confidence level. Uh, for example, UFA file book uh, two times faster and 34% uh, more books than the second best father. You will find also enjoy about uh, a live web in transition time, for example, uh, 15 times faster than the Swift Bay FM Go, and a minimal runtime overhead compared to the FM QMU. UEFA uh, reduce a lot portion of choosing input uh, around ninety uh, percent and spend only second in post processing phase. So another practical application of limited fuzzing is past testing. So the goal is to find incomplete patch or regression box. Also, uh, by exploring around the previously vulnerable code, we could uh, find new bugs. So how do we do? First, we identify recently discovered UAF bugs of open source programs. As the code has evolved in some cases, we need to manually uh, extract code instruction in the bug trace uh, and use them as target to guide uh, UA files. So actually, UA files found 30 new bugs, and four of them are incomplete uh, UAF bug fix in critical programs and got uh, seven CVs. This table details our finding. Uh, for example, we found an uh, incomplete uh, fix of GNU pass by using the bug tray of uh, existing double free. So to summarize what we went over in this talk, uh, we propose a directed fuzzing framework to detect you after free bugs at binary level. And we saw its uh, effectiveness and efficiency in bug reproduction and uh, path testing application. So, four key takeaway points of our talk. So, first, read fuzzing is practical and should be integrated into the software development process. Second, we should uh, develop uh, vulnerabilities oriented further to actually. Uh, effectively detect a uh, complex bug. And third, uh, pass-oriented fuzzing is uh, bigger uh, than the uh, bus testing. And finally, we should uh, find and fix the uh, variance of uh, bug class. Uh, thank you for your attention and we check out uh, our paper and our tool. So we're happy to take any question. Hi everyone uh, in the internet connection. So if you have any question, we'll be happy to answer it. Um, okay. Uh, so, 
So yes, there is a GitHub repo. Uh, actually, I think it's the last slide. So there is a, a GitHub uh, repo on the slide. You you will have the address. Okay, so a lot of questions coming. Um, so Kenta, regarding your talk, so we have a GitHub, uh, Kenta, regarding your talk. Um, so indeed, the, the main idea is uh, be behind UFOs is to, to realize that usual directed further. Uh, just don't really take into account uh, the specificities of the bug they are looking for. It's good for memory overflow, but clearly this is a problem for use after free. And so we try to, to take that into account. And here, one of the very important points was about uh, sequenceness ordering. So that's one point. Uh, but there are also other things. But it's the idea of all these metrics that Mandung uh, just uh, described. Uh, it's all about putting, um, putting intelligence, putting knowledge of the vulnerability, of the kind of vulnerability inside the directed uh, fuzzing process. And it's why it works better. Question, so what kind of program did we test again? This is probably more question for Mandung, but at the end of the slides, uh, you will have... Um, So basically, a, a, a table with a, with a different vulnerability we found and so on. Uh, so basically, we, we have two kind of experiments. On the one experiment, we uh, we compare with uh, with other directed further, but which are not uh, tailored to use after free. So we take uh, their benchmark. So I don't really remember. Uh, We check, uh, we take uh, use after free bugs on some programs, uh, take patch version and see if we can find bugs in this patch version. So in this case, we have programs like uh, GNU patch, Perl 5, uh, new PDF, some stuff like that. So we, we have also a technical report on the web where you, there is also some address in the slide and there are much more detail on that. Uh, okay, so there is a white paper. Actually, there is even an academic paper which has been accepted to read. This is an academic conference. Uh, so the paper will appear, I guess, in September. And I think there will be a, anyway, a technical paper before that on my webpage and on the webpage of Mandung uh, really soon. We, we have a camera ready version. So, uh, and we have all the details about the programs, experiments, data, and so on. Oh, perfect. So Harrison, I will let Mandung uh, answer for this question because actually I'm not sure he's the main uh, programmer and designer of a tool. Actually, I would say uh, regarding Valgrind, unless Mandung saw the thing, but I would say that it can. The thing is, uh, from Valgrind, the thing we take is really the, um, uh, what we really, really need is about the kind of um, bug trace, the kind of format. So that's not a very big, big problem.
Any other question? Okay. So I let you, let's say 10 seconds for last question. Otherwise we stop. Okay. Thank you guys. That was uh, really, really interesting. Uh, hope you enjoy it and uh, see you next time. Bye.